Final Fantasy has had some weird ass characters over the years. They've had an orange tiger, a member of the Blue Man Group, and the world record holder for worst breath. But all of these pale in comparison to this plump, frog loving, chef tastic, gender questionable, and fork wielding coup. So I challenged myself to beat Final Fantasy IX with only Quina. Only Quina can attack enemies, and everyone else must attack themselves. Quina must be in the party at every available opportunity, but if they suffer a terrible bout of food poisoning, poisoning, everyone else can take over. And finally, no chocobo hot and cold items. Period. That would make things too easy. The complete set of rules are in the discriddly do, so let's get this roast to cooking. As is often the case, the game begins without our pudgy protagonist, so let me give you the highlights. We name Zidane Sanji, Vivi Gusto, and Steiner Chef Gordon Ramsay. The fucking boss is fucking rough! I encounter this suspicious character in the kitchen and try to get them to join our party, but to no avail. The feast for the princess's birthday is too important. We get blown up, roast some kale, and then procure some seal meat. Princess Garnet then sees Sanji's beautiful chef's knife and renames herself Pudding. Freya too joins the party and is called Remy. I steal an airship, Pudding drugs our dinner, and then, hungry after our drugged slumber, the party heads to the swamp to seek out sustenance. And there we meet Quina. Again, I guess, but this time Quina joins our party and we find ourselves in a world of pain. Oh, and we call them Taste Tea. Throughout this run, Taste Tea will make it her mission to decimate the frog population by eating them. Taste Tea gobbles down five, and they also eat one of the Gigan Toads, Gigantoads? Gigantoads in the swamp to gain the frog drop blue magic. And while this ability might not do too much damage now, it will power up as Taste Tea gobbles more amphibians. And speaking of eating, gathering blue magic by eating enemies will be incredibly important as I take our chef throughout their journey. Enemies have to be weakened first though, and Taste Tea's strength is pitiful at this point. So their love of delicious pink lizard flesh is their undoing, and I die. And the second time I fight them, I accidentally kill the trio. Taste Tea's physical attacks deal semi-random damage, so it's difficult at this point to strike without killing their enemies. And eventually, I just give up and have her learn Aqua Breath from the crabs outside instead. Spoilers though, I won't use this blue magic for the entire game because of its low accuracy. But one important blue magic they do learn is Pumpkin Head. This ability deals damage equal to Taste Tea's maximum HP minus the number of HP they've lost, and the damage isn't at all affected by enemy defense. So while it's a dangerous choice to use, it's potentially incredibly effective if they use it at the right point. And if you happen to notice that I mess up Taste Tea's pronouns, please just leave me alone. Because right now, the only thing relevant to Taste Tea is the number of game overs that I experience during this section. And it's just from normal enemies. And it's way too high. And it's my fault. Anyway, I grab a bird that is far too small for Taste Tea to ride, and then I head to Gizma Luke's Grotto. At this point, the coral ring becomes crucial. I acquired this item by losing the hunting tournament a little bit earlier, or rather by letting Remy win. This item does two important things. It teaches the Insomniac ability, which prevents sleep, and it also allows Taste Tea to absorb all thunder attacks. And this is quite useful against the fight against the black mages in this area. They can't be eaten, but they do have a devastating fear of pumpkins. And after their death, we move on to Taste Tea's first actual boss fight against Gizmaluk. And the strategy for this battle is simple. Use a tent on Gizmaluk, causing the blind and silent statuses. This makes it impossible for Gizmaluk to use its powerful water spells and also prevents it from hitting its physical attacks as easily. And as for Taste Tea's damage, I basically have them use Pumpkin Head continuously. With their HP somewhat depleted, she does more damage with that than anything else. But this method is high risk, high reward, and eventually Gizmaluk hits some strong attacks and I die. And then I die a second time. Hugely disappointing. This snake should be soup by now. So ultimately, I head out and grind a bit. With more HP, Tace's pumpkin head can do a ton more damage while allowing her more safety. Does that stop me from dying when Alamia attacks me on the way back in though? No. 
but when I head back in, Taste Tea is at level 13 with 542 HP. This makes me feel a lot safer. So on to my next try. Once Gizmaluk is disabled, I go back to my normal pumpkin-headed strategy. It's complicated by the fact that Gizmaluk occasionally counters with silence, disabling blue magic, but ultimately I'm able to bop him to death and escape this terrifying dungeon. After a brief pickle break, we return to our culinary genius and visit Bermesia, a land in which even the mice won't eat the food. Oh, Jesus. Gross. But there is one person who has dared to dine here, famed food critic and resident lady smasher Beatrix. But unfortunately, Beatrix is a problem. If you've watched any of my other solo runs, which I will link in the discreetly do, you know that Beatrix's shock can take out Taste Tea in one hit. That means that in order to survive it, we have to grind some more. Fortunately, most of the enemies in this area aren't too big a deal, particularly since our chef is at a pretty high level because of the earlier grind we did for Gizmaluk. So I take Taste Tea to level 16 and I head on in. And with the Coral Ring equipped and Taste Tea in the back row, chances are good. But even better, earlier they learned the Mighty Guard ability from some dragons. I think it was from some dragons. I don't remember. This spell, while expensive MP-wise, is crucial to this battle. Because you may notice that Taste Tea's HP is still rather low. However, with Mighty Guard, we can cut the damage from Beatrix's shock attack by a striking amount. It's an expensive spell, but with the Protect status, Beatrix does less than 300 damage with shock, allowing Taste to survive two shock attacks easily. But in a devastating turn of events, Beatrix casts shock a third time before I can refresh the Mighty Guard spell and I survive. Oh my God, she survived. Holy hell. How, how am I surviving that? Wow, that's not what I expected to happen. And soon after, Beatrix ends the battle with a stock break, making this the easiest this battle has ever been. A shocking conclusion. Editor, put lightning here. Lightning. Ha! Ouch. Too hard. Ah. We take a brief break from our forky friend to chill with Chef Ramsay and Pudding. They fight a black mage, earn some free money by crafting and selling some cotton aprons, and grab a reflect ring from the auction house, which will be crucial later. And once the collectathon is over, a snake gets roasted, Pudding gets reduced into runny mousse, and Taste Tea rises, revitalized by the Burmesian crisper. And on their search for live mice to swallow whole, the journey brings Taste Tea to the mouse tree. Before we head on to our next boss battle, I force Taste to eat a big black cock. I mean rooster, from which they learn the white wind ability. And this ability is kind of just a gimmick. It heals a third of Taste Tea's current HP, not their max HP, to the entire party. Unfortunately, this means that Taste can't heal themselves when already at low HP. And this ability is weird to me because whenever I make White Wind, I tend to have more of a destructive effect. But I digress. And more importantly, Taste slurps down a carrion worm, which teaches the most important ability in the game. He always gives away the ending so early. Give them a moment to think about it and consider buying a boat. Toodaloo. Taste Tea then gets entranced by a sand pit, thinking it's Rocky Road ice cream and jumps on in. And this gets us a silk robe and some magician shoes, two items that I will desperately need in about 10 minutes. But before that, we enter Mortal Kombat with an antlion. And it does not go well because I accidentally let Gusto attack. You fucking donkey! You already had your chance, buddy. Let Taste Tea have a turn. So I try again. And unfortunately, the Antlion Sandstorm blinds both Gusto and Taste, meaning Gusto has a very hard time offing himself. But eventually, the Antlion hocks a loogie at him and takes him out. And here is where Taste Tea finally unleashes the Carrion Worm's power. Auto life. This blue magic breaks the game wide open, because if Taste Tea casts auto life on themselves and then dies, they are immediately brought back to life. And if Taste Tea dies, as they do in this battle, I can recast the spell. However, it has one big limitation. It only brings them back up to one HP, meaning they can still die pretty easily if an enemy gets in an attack. 
And that's exactly what happens, and I die. But I'm no stranger to persistence, so I try again. The big problem with the antlion is that with its sandstorm attack, it can immediately bring taste down to critical HP, meaning any attack can immediately destroy them. But this time, if the antlion casts sandstorm, I just cure with white wind or a high potion. And because taste T's HP is pretty low, I have them attack with pumpkin head. This does a ton of damage based on taste T's missing HP. In this battle, it typically does between 400 and 700 HP, a huge amount for this point in the game. And eventually, the antlion chokes. It casts trouble mucus, which is actually a pretty cool attack. This inflicts the trouble status. This status makes damage done to the troubled character also get dealt to other party members. But because Taste T is the only one alive, it's useless and the antlion would be better off using more damaging attacks. And one final pumpkin head allows Taste T to slurp up his delicious buggy juices. But trouble on the delicious gum tree is not yet over. Queen Braun wants to steal our food and take advantage of Taste T's immaculate mise en place, so we decide to just stomp all over the food so she can't use it. But unfortunately, Queen Braun sends in her sous chef and chief media correspondent, General Beatrix. You're making me mad! And the battle with Beatrix is basically the same as before. Survive 10 turns, Beatrix smash. And with auto life, this battle should once again be easy peasy. I cast it and Beatrix immediately casts shock, taking out Taste T. And then Taste masterfully dodges an attack, allowing them to recast auto life. But then she shocks again. Taste comes back to life, but then Beatrix lashes out with a physical attack, ending our culinary career before it even begins. But on attempt number two, I revert back to my old strategy from the first Beatrix battle. I equip Auto Potion and Taste casts Mighty Guard on themselves. This prevents Shock from killing them in the first place. As an added layer of protection, I also cast Auto Life. I do this because once Mighty Guard wears off, Beatrix cleans up the kitchen with a Shock attack before I can refresh it. She follows that up with a physical attack and then Taste T gets roasted. But on the third try, Taste T gets up Mighty Guard right away, and then I immediately use an Aether. Mighty Guard costs 64 HP, so without a ton of leveling, she gets one cast. One. That's it. Beatrix eventually gets Taste down to 16 HP, and I decide it's time to get out the fire extinguisher. I have Taste use an elixir to fully heal HP and MP, and I recast Mighty Guard. But right after this, Beatrix ends the battle. But while Taste T has won this battle, they have lost the war. Because as a robust and rotund chef who fears heights, the Black Mage teleporters are a no-go for them. Queen Braun uses her Horsey Summon, which received a degree from the prestigious University of Nunya Business School, to destroy the delicious tree and its fruit. And with that fruit goes Taste Tea, never to be heard from again. But if this fruit hears from them beyond the beyond, we will continue the challenge at that point. With Taste Tea presumably in the big kitchen in the sky, we seek revenge on Queen Braun. So we fight the giant cookbook Tentarian to get the running shoes, take back the pudding Braun stole from us, fricassee some rabbit dog, learn to make lightning roasted steak from Father Time, and flee to the outer continent. But on the way there, we encounter a spooky surprise. Taste Tea's ghost! Okay, it's not their ghosts, they're just an indestructible force of nature. Anyway, we head through Fossil Rue to the next boss challenge, Lonnie. I don't really expect her to be a problem. My main strategy for this battle is to keep Taste T at low HP and use Pumpkin Head to take advantage of this differential. And keeping Taste T at low HP really isn't that dangerous because Mighty Guard will reduce Lonnie's damage and- Oh uh, shit. Well, let's try that one again. I elect to stick with a high HP strategy this time. It doesn't really seem worthwhile to take risks in this battle since Lonnie's magic is pretty strong and Taste T's HP growth is pretty meager. I also cast Auto Life this time as a lifeline and then I go to town with Pumpkin Heads. I do try out Taste's Frog Drop ability, but at this point it does a piddly 120 damage, so it's not worth talking about now. Anyway, my pumpkin seeds bear orange fruit and this allows Taste T to end Cleaverella's sorry excuse for a kidnapping attempt. Before we move on, there's one more blue magic I need to acquire, Knight. And I can get it from these Medusa friends. 
Night puts every target on the field to sleep, but fortunately it can be blocked by Insomnia. This means that Taste can put all enemies to sleep rather safely. And will this come in handy later? Well, honestly, I don't remember. Well, anyway, we head through Fossil Rude to the Dwarven Chef Village, to the Black Chef Village, and back to the Dwarven Chef Village. And since they won't let us through, Sanji and Pudding get married. And feeling caught up in the spirit, Tasty and Gusto follow suit. And I think that this is a great time to talk about Queen as gender. So back to canon names for just a moment. And if you want to just focus on battles in this video, skip to this timestamp right here. Most people in the Final Fantasy community use they them pronouns to refer to Queena. However, this might not be quite right. The characters in this game are somewhat stymied by Queena's gender identity, although they don't seem to be too bothered by the lack of an obvious pronoun. And the closest thing to a pronoun preference Queena expresses is this. World very simple place. World only have two things. Things you can eat and things you know can eat. The devs left us one more clue though. Queena can use some equipment like the Lamia's tiara that can typically only be used on girls. However, some girly equipment like the Kachusa is unavailable to her. And even more confusing, Zidane will not protect Queena with his Protect Girls ability. And even more confusing than that, it's unclear whether Queena's species, the Ku, even have any concept of gender to begin with. They don't talk about it at all. So knowing that, what is Queena's gender? Is Queena female, male, non-binary, just doesn't have a gender at all? And the real answer is this. Queena doesn't care. Maybe the Ku have gender, but just don't use the same words we do for them. Or maybe gender holds less meaning for them. Or maybe they just don't refer to gender openly. Or maybe the Ku have no concept of gender at all. So I declare officially that the correct pronouns for Queena are... Drumroll please. Whatever the fuck you want. Because Queena is fictional and gives zero fucks about the whole thing. Yay! Tasty spots rare game and temporarily leaves the party, but they'll be back. So we name Aiko Boyardee, fight Shrek in a giant zombie tree, and recruit Amaranth, whom we name Guy Fieri. Pudding's mom suffers a dragon-related boating accident, and by the way, don't buy a boat. No, really, don't do it, no matter what Captain Tantasies says. And the city of Alexandria suffers an angel-related incident, which I'm pretty sure is related to the boat, and we compete in a card tournament. And for once, the rebirth ring you get from the card tournament is not really a big deal because of Queena's auto life blue magic. But I still get it anyway because I'm a GigaChad gamer. Aww. He's suffering from a severe case of gaming delusion. Cat, did you just fart? The cat just farted. We are hereby henceforth shaming this cat who has farted during a video recording. Bad girl. You're a- oh, we love you though. You're the cutest little kitty. But anyway, despite my issues with boats, we actually do get one. It's not ours, it belongs to Lindblum, and because I was feeling conflicted, I decided this was a good time to give my cat a treat. God damn, Churu is crack. Look at how she eats the foil to get to the liquid meat. Crazy. But speaking of meat, Taste Tea now rejoins our party. That means it's time to head to confront Kuja and his enormous piece of meat at the Desert Palace. Before we head to the Desert Palace, I have some business to take care of. You may have noticed the teeny tiny 100 frog donation counter in the bottom right portion of the screen. And that is there because I told my chat that if they donated $500 during my stream of this game, I would catch 100 frogs. Which is torture. But I'm not ready to talk about it yet because we're only at $375 so far, so they haven't earned my tears. Yet. Anyway, Desert Palace. We get captured, put Tasty into the party, and head to Oil Burns. Unfortunately, Oil Burns does not allow the use of magic, so there will be no auto life shenanigans. But Oil Burns does have a giant airboat we need to fight. Arc. So I equip Tasty with their finest fork, auto haste, auto potion, and clear headed, and sell all of my regular potions so that auto potion will only use high potions. And then I start the fight. And the strategy for this fight is very simple. I have Tasty attack. That's it. But I made a big mistake. In addition to equipping auto potion, I also equipped counter. This causes, as you might expect, a counter attack, which is awesome. 
except that characters in Final Fantasy IX can only perform one reaction per attack that hits them. This means that a good deal of the time, Tasty counterattacks instead of using Auto Potion, which means that Tasty gets worn down and I die. So I unequip counter and head back in to beat down this boat. And this time, things go a lot better. Arc's wind attacks do very little because of Lamia's tiara, propeller wind is negated by clear-headed, and boomerang is weak enough that Tace can survive it. The one threat is Photon, which reduces their HP to 1, but Auto Potion makes sure that it will never kill them. And I make a big play here. Yep, I literally just left and let Auto Attack do the work for me, just like in the Garnet run. I did come back to check up though because I'm a very supportive parent. And then I realized that we still had a bunch of time left, so I grabbed the cat to display her to the audience and sang a beautiful song. Meow, 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 meow. Uh, 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 uh. Meow, 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 meow. Uh, 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 uh. And this battle takes so long that the switch actually idles and goes dark. But eventually, Tasty removes this maritime meddler from existence. But if we're really going to beat this game with only Taste Tea, we have to do a little bit of time travel. So I reload my previous save before oil burns and have a second party complete it and then have Taste Tea fight through the Desert Palace. And at the end of it, we fight Valley Apira. And Valley Apira is not very hard, namely because I equip Taste Tea with a Reflect Ring and Auto Reflect and have them cast level 4 Holy. When did I learn that? Was that from Fossil Rue from the Stingray guys? I don't remember, whatever. I learned it, I used it, and Valley Apira's spells get bounced back onto it and Taste Tea wins. Thank you, Chef. Unfortunately though, Kuja now kidnaps Chef Boyardee, so Taste Tea needs to head to Mount Goulash to rescue her. And as is my custom, I get wrecked by these lava birds. Twice. I hate them. And I also get envenomated by a giant plant. I hate them. And I also fight some pretty dragons. I hate them. But fortunately, with Lamia's tiara and auto potion and taste tea chillin' in the back row, there's very little they can do to taste tea. And with the night blue magic, which we talked about earlier, and I wasn't sure if it would be useful, but look, now it is! I did the thing! We can just put them to sleep and level four holy them to death. Okay, I actually fork the second one to death, but mostly level four holy. The second set, I don't even bother putting to sleep. But I realized something. Taste Tea goes into trance. Now, normally Taste Tea can only eat an enemy if they have less than 25% of their max HP. But in trance, they can eat enemies with less than 50% HP. And with enemies like these dragons, which have a ton of HP, this can save a ton of time. So I devour the first dragon and simply fork the second one to death. But there's one more battle before we can rescue our ravioli. multi -gamini. I equip the golden hairpin, which teaches the auto regen ability, and then I get that and auto haste queued up. And multi -gamini is honestly not the worst boss of this challenge. It uses a lot of poison attacks, which we're immune to, and nothing else it can do is really too threatening. Particularly with auto regen and auto potion on board. So I put on auto attack and let Tace fork over this giant blob monster. And eventually they take him out and we get our airship. With our new airship, we take a vacation to Ibsen's castle. There, weak weapons are great and strong weapons do very little. However, magic works just as it always has. But still, I go capture some more frogs and acquire Taste Tea's Silver Fork, which isn't useful right now, so whatever. And ultimately, Taste makes her merry way to a wall of mirrors. We take all four, Taharka gets angry that we're stealing his dinner, and Taste Tea's gotta saute him. Taharka has two stances, an open stance in which he takes full damage, and a closed stance in which he takes very little and will counterattack liberally. But Taste Tea does not care about either of these stances. I've been planning for this battle since the very beginning, because now is the time to unleash Frog Drop. Frog Drop does damage equal to the number of frogs caught multiplied by Taste T's level. Taste T is now at level 39, and we've caught 27 frogs, so this ability does 1,053 damage every time I use it, no matter what. So this is the only move that I use for this entire battle. And Taharka can't really do much to Taste Tea because of Auto Potion and Auto Regen. 
So Tasty and her legion of amphibians take him out with aplomb. And now that we have all four mirrors, it's time to fight the Earth Guardian. But before we do that, I take Tasty back to grab more frogs. This brings our frog total to 33 and nabs us the Bistro for. But now it's time to fight Earthy Baby. And this battle is kind of awesome. So I equip Auto Reflect to block elemental spells and the Gaia Gear to absorb earth spells and I head on in. I frog drop like crazy and the spell now does 1,353 damage, which is also awesome but I have one goal. I want the Earth Guardian at half health before Taste Tea hits trance, because this is the one boss that Taste Tea can eat, and this will save us a ton of time. But funny enough, Taste Tea has so many cards stacked in their favor that we don't even reach that point. Instead, the Earth Guardian has a lot of trouble doing any damage to Taste, and they get the Earth Guardian down to 25% health, and then they gobble him up and spit out the bones like Melina from Mortal Kombat. Melina wins. And learn the Earth Shake spell in the process. Yummy, yummy, yummy Earth Guardian in my tummy. I freaking love this game. But the whole reason we did this was so that we could travel to a place with new cuisine. Terra. But before we do that, I head to Dogwideo. There, I first sell all of my Phonix Pinones. The Phonix Pinones do three things. First, they teach Boyardi the Phonix summon when they're equipped. Second, they act as a Phonix down when used as an item. But third, and most importantly, when the party dies, there's a chance that Phonix will be summoned to battle to revive the entire party. But that's Echo's summon, so if it were to go off, it would just be a waste of my time. Pinone, are you triggered yet? Squall is dead, so I head into Terra. Terra is home to the most frustrating part of Final Fantasy IX, a section I call the Restricted Gauntlet. Three battles in a row with strong enemies, but you gotta fight them with limited characters. So Guy Fieri, Remy, and Sanji take out the Black Unicorn, and then we're on to Taste T's portion. They have to fight in Abaddon. They kill off Chef Ramsay right away, and they immediately get taken out by a Fandaga. So I try one more time. Once Chef Ramsay is dead, Taste T goes down to low HP. A White Wind restores their health, again, not doing the destructive thing that it does when I make it. Sanji comes back in and he tanks a blow, allowing Tasty to survive and lash out. I cast Auto Life for safety, and then I let loose some 1,353 damage frog drops. Unfortunately, though, Abaddon immediately kills Tasty with a Thundaga, though, meaning we gotta go right back in and I gotta start from the beginning. On the third try, Chef Ramsay goes down, and so too does Sanji. But then I have Taste cast Mighty Guard and Auto Life. I follow this up with a Pumpkin Head and let Auto Regen take care of things. But then Taste T goes down to a Thundaga, is revived by Auto Life, and then is taken down permanently by a physical attack. And this is sort of how things go during the fourth try, and the fifth try, and the sixth and seventh and eighth and ninth try for a while until I change my strategy. Let me know in the comments if you're triggered every time you have to use an elixir, because I am. Frog Drop is the move I use since it doesn't require Taste to be at low health. Gordon Ramsay goes down, Sanji comes in and dies, we cast Auto Life, and now it's time to Frog Drop. And just for fun, Abaddon misses its first attack. I initially use White Wind to heal, but then I eventually transition to just using Elixir since those will also restore Taste's MP. And while things do look dire for a minute, I use another Elixir and just keep Frog Dropping. And then a third Elixir when Taste goes too low, but then a Frog Drop finishes off this bug brain and we're able to destroy a giant turtle to end this section, which I hate. I hate this section. I really hate it. But there's one more set of bosses we need to beat before we're done. And the first is Kuja's Dragon. Fortunately, we have the Coronet, which negates all wind damage, the most dangerous of its attacks. And with Auto Potion and Auto Regen, we're able to frog drop this dragon to death quite quickly. Garland is next, and with Locomotion to prevent his stop ability, the only thing we need to worry about is his physical attacks, which oddly hit extremely hard. But fortunately, I accounted for this by casting Auto Life on Taste T. A Psychokinesis takes them out, Auto Life revives them, and things are looking dire as Garland casts another wave 
wave attack and T expertly dodges it. So I recast Auto Life and Garland then wastes a turn casting stop, allowing them to heal with an elixir. And then I realize something. That does so much freaking damage. How does that do so much? But I also realize that Earthshake does more damage than Frog Drop, so I start using that instead. And then I have the revelation of a lifetime. Is that just randomized damage or something? Like, what the hell is happening? Am I in the front row? Am I in the front freaking row? Yeah, Taste Tea was in the front row. Apparently during the limited gauntlet, it just randomly switches them to be in the front row for no reason whatsoever. So once I switch them back to the back row, everything gets easier because many of Garland's attacks are physical. And after I make this change, I'm able to take down Garland with no issue. Which brings us to the final battle of this gauntlet. Kuja. And with Kuja, my road doesn't really matter because he uses almost all magic attacks. Actually, maybe all magic attacks. Yeah, all? Right? Comments? Tell me in the comments. I don't know. I auto life, I earth shake, and then I just wait it out. Taste T's magic defense is adequate and they're able to take him out with no real issue. But there is one issue. And the issue is that at this point in the run, I receive a donation from a viewer that brings me over the $500 threshold to catch 100 frogs. Frogs, 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 frogs. That is enough of that. Stop it. I'd rather burn my own boat than listen to more of this. Goodbye. But before I can make good on my promise, I head into Memoria to fight an easy boss, another delicious lizard. And if you've watched any of my prior challenges of this game, which I've linked in the, okay, you've, we've done this before. It's in the Discord link too. Why do I do this? Anyway, it uses mostly wind and water attacks. So the ribbon completely negates everything it does and it goes down right away. I also collect all the remaining Stellatios and grab a robe of Lords from Queen Stella, which will be Tasty's final armor. I also equip Tasty with a Rosetta Ring and fight another delicious reptile, Malyrus. And with this equipped, Malyrus' fire attacks are negated and Tasty both eats its soft tissue and makes a bag out of its scales. Never let any piece of the boss go to waste. That's their motto. So I head back, die to a few random encounters as is my custom and start collecting some frogs. Unfortunately though, the frog side quest is rough, bitch. So ultimately I end up with my boyfriend shoving my cat in my face and with an incomplete side quest. But do not fret. Rather than doing the entire boring frog collection process on stream, I do it in my discord server with the Fantacles. The Fantacles are my YouTube channel members. For just $5 a month, they get early access to all of my videos, special previews, exclusive channels in the Tantacles Discord server, which you should join, and my undying gratitude. So if you love the videos that I make and are extraordinarily wealthy or just have a little bit of extra cash lying around, please consider donating $5 a month to become one of the Fantacles. Because my editors are amazing, but they're also expensive. I wanna pay them well. When you lock someone up in your editing dungeon for weeks at a time to work for you, you have to pay them, that's the law. But they're definitely there willingly. But anyway, if you are not 6'5 with blue eyes and a trust fund in finance, then please make sure that you're subscribed to the channel. It's free and it'll help Captain Tantases buy back the boat he sold to fund this video. And that's one more boat off the market so you won't buy it. Thank you. I appreciate each and every one of you and the fact that you watched to this point in the video, despite the fact that I'm a complete raving lunatic, means a lot to me. The frog collection process was harrowing. The frogs regenerate very slowly, so I decided to start up my Chrono Trigger Luca only run while I waited, because each frog regeneration cycle takes about two to three hours. But I don't quite get to 100. In fact, I get to 98, because I save that 99th and 100th frog for the next day's live. Because after you catch the 99th frog, Taste T gets to fight Final Fantasy IX's chief culinary officer, Quail. Quail has a few tricks up his sleeve, but nothing Taste can't handle. He can cast Confuse, Poison, Blind, and Mini, for example. So I equip Clear Headed to prevent confusion, but then I realize that Taste T does not have the Bright Eyes ability. Does she not have eyes? Are those not eyes? What are they then? and why can't they be bright? They get the counterattack ability, but it can't negate the blind status? Why? What is this? 
Okay, anyway, we just frog drop him to death. So now, with Taste Tea finally taking their rightful place on the throne as the CEO of Let's Fucking Go, we grab the final frog. This fulfills my promise to my viewers, and I unceremoniously head right back into Memoria to wreck some more shit. Starting with Tiamat. Tiamat can absorb Taste Tea's strength and then wail on them with strength and physical attacks but auto life may help me out here. And the fact that I collected 100 frogs is crucial because with 100 frogs collected, my frog drop attack now does 5,500 damage. So I auto life and I start smacking him down. Unfortunately though, he does have a claw attack that inflicts silence, but Tasty uses an echo screen, continues frog dropping as normal and takes him out on the first try. The Kraken is next, and let me tell you, I have an amazing Kraken. And with the Ribbon, its water attacks are completely negated, making this a free battle so we eat its Tantacles for dinner. Hey, that's me. But next up is a real challenge, the Lick. The Lich. The Lick. The Lich. Lick. The Lich. The Lich. This is usually the most difficult boss in the game because of all of the different ways it can cast death. Venom, stop, level five death, death, doom, and I think that's it. But as you might expect, Taste Tea has a secret weapon, auto life. I use auto life, throw a frog, get doomed, and then die to that doom status, which removes my auto life status. But then I get hit by an earth shake and I die. I really thought this was gonna be a clean sweep, but I got in my own way, as usual. Because had I just equipped the Gaia gear to absorb earth damage, which I do the second time, I probably would have won. So I head back in. And this time I get doomed right away and then immediately revived by auto life. But the like wastes a turn so I can refresh my auto life and then do misses. I frog drop, get killed by a death cutter, get revived by auto life, and then immediately get killed by a level five death which wouldn't have hit me at all had I just prepared properly and made sure my level wasn't a multiple of five. Ah! So I kill a behemoth and this raises my level to 56. And now I head back in. I auto life right away and things start out well. My frog drops are all hitting for good damage and I get hit by death, but then revived. I recast it and then do misses, which is a huge boon. But then the like just kind of starts wasting turns and I get a bunch more frog drops in until it casts death again. But I'm able to revive, recast auto life and I crawl on. I get doomed by death cutter again, which takes me out, but I'm revived. I recast auto life and get caught in the doomnado for a bit where the only thing I can do is recast auto life continually. But eventually I escape the vicious cycle. This is the way we talk in Tucson, Arizona. When the like misses a cast of doom and one final frog drop takes him out, meaning we only have three bosses left. Wah! And the first boss in our way is Death Guise. And this broski starts off with a meteor, which does massive damage. But with the Robe of Lords, nothing else he has can really touch Taste Tea. He can use the death attack, but for whatever reason, he doesn't, and Taste Tea Amphiba hits him to death. And the next boss is Kuja, and Kuja's main MO is just using magic against us. And with the massive magic defense afforded by the Robe of Lords along with auto life, Kuja can't do too much to Taste Tea. They do get taken down a couple times, but they're able to refresh auto life each time, eventually showing Kuja the meaning of green with envy. I don't know what I meant by that joke when I wrote it. I don't, oh, frogs. It was about the frogs, the frogs are green. Okay, cool, I did it. And finally, we're on to the big kahuna, Chef Necron. As always, the big challenge here is Grand Cross, which can inflict every status effect in the book, including death. But the strategy is still the same. I frog drop over and over. The first Grand Cross inflicts no status effects at all, so Tasty keeps getting froggy with it. The second Grand Cross comes out, and unfortunately, Taste Tea gets hit with Mini and Berserk. And this is pretty damn bad. With Berserk, they can't use Frog Drop, and with Mini, any physical attacks will do no damage. But once again, Auto Life saves me, because Chef Necron uses Neutron Ring, a physical attack that takes out Taste Tea. And when they get taken out, Auto Life revives them with all status effects removed. 
This means that I can refresh auto life and continue using Frog Drop. But before I can destroy Chef Necron, a third Grand Cross comes out and it does nothing. No status effects. And with a few more frog drops, Necron is destroyed, meaning that I've beaten Final Fantasy IX with only Queena. I feel like they should do a spin-off of this game that's like, will Queena eat it? And just put a ton of things in front of them and be like, will Queena eat the frog legs? Well, okay, obviously they'll eat the frog legs because it's Queena. Okay, bye-bye. Click the thing.